speakers for this session are Eleanor Rapoli and Dave Sandal. Eleanor received her bachelor's in geological science and geographic information systems and her master's in environmental science, both from Michigan State University. During, uh, during graduate school at MSU, she studied the relationship between flood risk and resiliency among Michigan residents to inform flood mitigation strategies. Now she is at the Association for, flood, for State Flood Plan Managers in Madison, Wisconsin, taking the research she did in her master's and applying it to committees nationwide. She will share with you her research and passion for studying dynamic coastlines and how communities are increasing their resilience to flooding in a world of rapidly expanding floodplains. Dave is a wildlife biologist with a special interest in avian ecology. He received his bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife biology from Michigan State University. During most summers, you can find him traversing the northern Great Plains, assessing the health of natural habitats by collecting and analyzing bird population data. During the mitigate migration season in the fall, you can find him on the southeast coast or in mid-Michigan, banding birds and monitoring migrational patterns. In the off season, he's in the Midwest tapping maple trees, foraging, and birding from his own backyard. His passion for avian ecology and natural science takes him across the country and will lead him into a career working to promote global bio biodiversity through the protection of birds and their habitats. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us, Ms. Repoli and Mr. Sandal. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. My name is Eleanor Rapley, and today I'll be talking about flooding in the US and how it is one of our nation's biggest threats. Dave, my co-presenter, will be talking about the impacts of flooding on bird species after me, and there will be time for questions after both of our presentations. So with that, I will begin. So I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of background on who I am and what I do. Lucas did a great job, but I'm gonna to add to that. Um, I sit in Madison, Wisconsin, working at the Association for State Floodplain Managers as a NOAA fellow. Um, and I can't present without showing a picture of my dog, Kepler. <laughs> the issues that I'll be talking to you today about in my presentation are not very warm and fuzzy, um, but this image of Kepler is, so uh, hopefully you can think of her when I'm talking about some of the more <laughs> uh, not so warm and fuzzy things, so. So um, I'm originally from Gross Point, Michigan. I grew up exploring the Midwest. I always knew I loved the outdoors and science, but I had no idea that the two would have such a big impact on my career path. I uh, received my bachelor's of science in geological sciences with a minor in geographic information systems from Michigan State University. My interest in rocks and studying Earth's history led me to an internship at the US Geological Survey in Reston, Virginia. And in this internship, I studied um, the widening of rivers and increases in flooding due to heavier rainfall in the Northeastern US. That internship sparked my interest in flooding and I decided to go back to MSU to pursue a master's in environmental science. Uh, during my master's, I studied the rising risk of flooding in Michigan and how communities are responding to it. My research led me to receiving a NOAA fellowship, which I recently started after finishing my master's program last summer. And through this research, I get to take the research I did in my master's and expand on it by helping communities enhance their resiliency to flooding in a meaningful way. And as for what's next, I'm not sure, but I hope to continue doing some other research. I just wanted to share with you my journey to show that a career path is not always straightforward. <laughs> There's usually one or two or many curveballs, such as a pandemic, for example, um, that get thrown at you and you have to be flexible. So um, the best advice someone gave me was to describe what you want to do in your career rather than confining yourself to a label or a job title, for example. Instead of saying I wanted to be a professor, um, which is what I thought people wanted to hear, I instead defined what I wanted to do, which was um, doing research on flooding and working with 
communities. And that opened up a lot of opportunities for me. So for those who are thinking about their careers and their next steps into college, um, feel free to ask me questions about that. So where am I today? Um, so for my NOAA fellowship that I mentioned, I'm working at the Association for State Floodplain Managers in Madison, Wisconsin. A little background on ASFPM. It's a nonprofit organization whose mission is kind of twofold. Um, it's to promote education policies and activities that mitigate current and future flood losses, costs, and hum human suffering caused by flooding. And the second is to protect the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains. Uh, ASFPM is a well-respected voice in floodplain management and policy and is also a part of NOAA's Digital Coast Partnership that works to provide resources for states and local communities. Um, and so I'll briefly talk about some of the research I'm doing at, AS at ASFPM later on. So with that, let's learn about flooding. So floods are the most common and among the most deadly natural disasters in the U.S. Floods have brought destruction to every state and nearly every county. And in many areas, they are getting worse. This map shows properties that have been damaged by floods, ranking from minor to extreme damages, uh, dark red being extreme damages, and yellow being um, minor damages. You can see that clusters of damaged properties outline the coasts and city centers, as you might expect. And as global warming continues to exacerbate sea level rise and extreme weather, our nation's floodplains are expected to grow by approximately 45% by the end of the century. So before we talk about how climate change and flooding are linked, we need to understand what a flood is and what causes them. And so a flood is simply an accumulation of water over normally dry land. There are a few types of flooding that I will briefly go over. Uh, the first is river or fluvial flooding. This occurs when a river or stream overflows its natural banks and inundates normally dry land. River flooding is the most common in late winter and early spring and um, results from heavy rain, rapidly melting snow or ice dams. According to one study, approximately 41 million Americans are at risk of river flooding. And this picture to the right um, is of a catastrophic uh, Missouri River flood that occurred in 2011. Next is coastal or tidal flooding, which happens when winds from a coastal storm, such as a hurricane or a nor'easter, push a storm surge, which is a wall of water, from the ocean onto land. Storm surge can produce widespread devastation. Uh, in addition, there are increasing numbers of shallow non-life threatening floods caused by higher sea levels, and these are called high tide, high tide floods. Um, and they just occur when the sea washes up and over roads and into storm drains um, as the daily tides roll in on the coast. More than 8.6 million Americans live in areas susceptible to coastal flooding. And to the right is a picture of Mexico Beach, Florida after Hurricane Michael in 2018. The third type of flooding is flash flooding. The, these quick rising floods are most um, often caused by heavy rains over a short period, usually six hours or less. Um, flash floods can happen anywhere, although low-lying areas with poor drainage are particularly vulnerable. Uh, flash floods also caused by dam or levee breaks or the sudden overflow of water due to debris or ice jams um, can cause flash floods. Uh, flash floods combine the innate hazards of floods with speed and unpredictability and are responsible for the greatest number of flood-related deaths. Um, to the right is a picture of the aftermath of a flash flood in Phoenix, Arizona in 2014. Um, and also the dam failures in Midland, Michigan that happened last summer were um, due to flash flooding. And I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the fourth and final type is urban or pluvial flooding. Flash floods, coastal floods, and river floods can occur in urban areas, but the term urban flooding refers specifically to flooding that occurs when rainfall, uh, not on, um, rainfall not an overflowing body of water, um, but uh, rainfall overwhelms the local stormwater drainage capacity of a densely populated area. And this happens when 
Rainfall runoff is channeled from roads and parking lots from buildings and other impervious surfaces um, to storm drains and sewers that cannot handle the volume. To the right is a picture of the aftermath of urban flooding in Hoboken, New Jersey in 2007. All right, so what causes flooding? Uh, many, many factors go into the making of a flood and they kind of fall under two categories. Um, one of which is weather related causes and the other is human related causes. Weather related um, consists of things like storm surge, as I mentioned, heavy rainfall and snow melt. And there are human driven elements, including how we manage our waterways, uh, via dams, levees, reservoirs. Um, here's a picture of the levees breaking in, in New Orleans after Katrina. And um, other human related factors are land use change, what, what we do to alter the land, um, increased urbanization, for example, or urban gr growth, uh, adds pavement and other impermeable, impermeable surfaces. Um, alters natural drainage systems and often leads to more homes being built on floodplains. Um, in cities, under maintained infrastructure can lead to urban flooding a lot of the time. Uh, and here's a picture of Detroit. And Detroit actually used to have a lot more rivers, but many were redirected or buried to build the city. Um, people have always lived near to water, and flooding would still occur if climate change did not exist. Um, but more and more flooding factors are also linked to climate change. So how does climate change lead to flooding? Um, so connecting climate change to floods can be a tricky endeavor. Um, not only do weather and human related factors play into whether or not a flood occurs, but um, limited data on the floods of the past make it difficult to measure them against the climate driven trends of floods today. However, the IPCC or um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change noted that it is increasingly clear that climate change has influenced several of the water-related variables that contribute to floods, uh, such as rainfall or snow melts. Um, and so in other words, while our warming world may not induce floods directly, it exacerbates many of the factors that do. I'm going to show you how we see weather and human-related factors being impacted by climate change today and in the future. So a warmer atmosphere holds and sub sub subsequently dumps more water. And so as the country has heated up on average of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since 1901, it has also become about 4% wetter with the Eastern half of the United States being the soggiest. <laughs> These maps on the right depict annual and seasonal changes in precipitation over the US. Teal colors indicated, um, indicate an increase in precipitation and the brown colors indicate um, a decrease in precipitation. In the Northeast and Midwest, the most extreme storms generate approximately 27% more moisture than they did a century ago. Basically because of global warming, when it rains, it pours. Looking forward, heavy precipitation events are projected to increase by two to three times the historical average in every region. Um, of course, heavy rainfall does not automatically lead to floods, but it increases the potential for them. And even moderate amounts of rainfall can cause serious damages, uh, particularly in places where urban flooding is on the rise. In addition, in regions where seasonal snow melt plays a significant role in annual runoff, hotter temperatures can trigger more rain on snow events, and with warmer rains, um, induces faster and often earlier melting. And so this phenomenon is playing out in the Western US, um, which are regions with higher rain to snow melt ratios. And so we should expect to see higher stream flow and higher flood risk due to that snow melt. Um, okay. So last summer, we saw right here in Michigan, what happens when weather and human related elements interact. On May 19th, there was a heavy rainfall event, which helped cause two dam failures along the Titabawassee River upstream of Midland, Michigan. Um, so 
to direct your attention to the, your, the right of your screen, um, look at these satellite images taken by Landsat, Landsat excuse me. Um, and you can see that on June 3rd, um, all looks normal. And on May 20th, we see a drastic change in the size and color of the river. You can see that Midland sits right on the river's floodplain on the bottom right corner where the sediment rich waters are on top of parts of the city. Waters reached around 35 feet, way above the 20 foot flood stage. Uh, Governor Whitmer declared a state of emergency and 10,000 Michigan residents were ordered to evacuate. Many people, um, many people's homes were inundated with up to nine feet of water causing 200 million in flood damages total. Luckily, there were no deaths or injuries. Um, so it was later revealed that the dams had been under maintained and had a long history of non-compliance with federal regulations and adequate spillway capacity. Um, unfortunately, this is not uncommon. We do not manage our waterways very well. And on top of it, a lot of our infrastructures, such as stormwater drains, bridges, dams, levees, um, they were not built with climate change in mind. Um, so they are not built to handle the heavier precipitation that we are going to see in the future and that we are starting to see today. So we should take these dam failures as a warning. Um, climate change is increasing the frequency of our strongest storms, a uh, trend expected to continue throughout the century. Um, in the Atlantic Basin, an 80% increase in the frequency of category four and five storms, um, which are the most destructive, is expected over the next 80 years. In 2020, um, there was a new record set for disaster events with $22 billion weather and climate disasters, um, shattering the previous record of 16 events in, in uh, 2011 and 2017. Um, 2020 was the sixth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar disaster events occurred in the US. Um, there were 13 severe storms, seven tropical cyclones, one drought, and one wildfire event in 2020 for a total loss of 95 billion. Okay, and so looking back, um, 2017 was the costliest year in disasters. 2017's Hurricane Harvey made landfall, landfall as a category four storm and soaked some 200,000 Houston homes and businesses with catastrophic floods. Um, Harvey was the nation's wettest storm in nearly 70 years. It was also slow and therefore able to dump more and result um, in a weakening of, uh, as a result of weakened um, atmospheric currents from a warmer atmosphere. Uh, experts estimate that climate change made Harvey's rainfall three times more likely and 15 times more intense. And then in 2018, Harvey was followed by Hurricane Florence, which set at least 28 flood records in California. So on and on, stronger storms can, um, uh, oh, I'll mention real quick, can also produce gustier winds that whip up greater uh, storm surge, which starts as much as eight inches higher than a century ago because of the sea level rise. It was um, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina's 28 foot storm surge that overwhelmed the levees around New Orleans in the picture I showed you before um, and caused the vast majority of deaths. Warm and fuzzy, right? <laughs> so, um, so, of course, we continue to build cities on coasts and bury islands right in the path of a hurricane. Oceanfront property is a hot commodity, and more and more Americans are living along the coast. Um, I'm going to talk about Dolphin Island as an example. So Dolphin Island is a 14.5 million long barrier island off the coast of Alabama and is shaped like a drumstick, as you can see here on the picture in the bottom left corner. Um, so barrier island by definition is meant to protect the mainland from erosion and storms and therefore itself erodes. So it seems like a silly place to build a house, doesn't it? <laughs> the Eastern end of the island is fairly lush, um, maritime forest and reasonably wide. And then on the western end of it, facing the Mississippi Sound and the Gulf of Mexico, um, that side has literally no elevation. And yet that's where um, all the big and expensive houses are, and they're all second beach homes. Um, the place has been hit by over a dozen hurricanes in the last few decades, including several major hurricanes um, after 
after being hit by a category two storm, some of the owners of these houses decided to elevate their homes to protect them. They elevated them to 15 feet in the air. And then in 2005, Hurricane Katrina happened and ran right into Dolphin Island and pushed 19 feet of storm surge. Um, well, 19 feet is more than 15 feet. And um, over the Western end of the island, we see this devastation where uh, these, uh, these uh, properties just got knocked right off of those stilts. But even after this happened, um, homeowners decided to rebuild again instead of relocate. And so um, residents of Dauphin Island, among many other barrier islands, um, this is happening in a lot of places, um, are continuously stuck in this dangerous flood build repeat cycle, which I will mention later on. Um, so as ocean temperatures rise and the world's glaciers and ice sheets melt due to climate change, global sea levels are rising. Our oceans are approximately seven to eight inches higher than they were in 1900. The IPCC predicts seas around the world will rise anywhere from one foot to more than four feet more by the end of the century. Uh, NOAA's projections show that, show that due to regional factors, such as currents bringing water to coastlines, places such as the East Coast could see seas as much as 9.8 feet higher by 2100. This will amplify storm surge and increase tidal flooding. Um, shown in the graph to the right, as an example, studies project that Charleston, South Carolina could see as many as 180 tidal floods per year by 2045, compared to the 15 that it saw in 2019. Um, and to see other places where flooding will occur due to sea level rise, you can check out NOAA's interactive sea level rise viewer, um, which is shown here on the bottom left. So as you might know, we are also seeing rises in inland seas, specifically the Great Lakes. Uh, the water levels in the Great Lakes reached a record high in 2020. Great Lakes Basin has an unusually high water to land ratio with five lakes encompassing approximately 33% of the basin area. And as a result, there are many consequences for this region, such as lake effect snow, which we have experienced. <laughs> and on average, water levels vary between 12 to 18 inches every year. Um, however, lake levels are fluctuating more drastically in recent years. The strong El Nino event in 1997 may be related to the recent 15-year period uh, when the Great Lakes water levels remained well below their monthly averages, as you can see here, uh, between 1998 to 2013 with record lows. Significantly warmer water temperatures led to higher evaporation rates from the lakes. Um, and, the rat, um, and that's what caused those record lows. And so um, there was a spike in water levels in 2013 from rapid, a rapid increase in, um, in precipitation levels and, uh, and lower evaporation rates. And the increased amount uh, and duration of ice cover. So all of these three factors contributed to record highs that we see here that have started from 2013 and are just continuing to rise. Um, although lake levels have gone down a little bit recently, they are predicted to continue to rise. Um, for the Great Lakes high, higher lake levels, that means more shoreline erosion, as you can see in the bottom left picture, and potential uh, for flooding. Uh, shoreline properties are sliding into water from Lake Superior to Lake Ontario. Docks, marinas, and harbors are underwater, and roads are getting washed out. Um, some local jurisdictions have already started taking action by moving public infrastructure further from the lakes, uh, but stricter zoning requirements and mitigation strategies are much needed. Um, so now that we've talked about the causes of flooding and how they're linked to climate change, let's talk more about the consequences. Um, and I want to give time for my co-presenter Dave to talk, so I'm going to kind of rush through some of these so that I can get through them. Um, so consequences of flooding have short-term and long-term, there's short-term and long-term consequences. <laughs> um, and so let's talk about these short-term consequences. Um, so one of the, you know, more obvious ones is, um, is loss of life. 
Um, floods can cause more than 100 U.S. deaths, or have caused more than 100 U.S. deaths annual, annually. The second obvious consequence is vast property damage. Uh, repairing and replacing flood damaged roads, bridges, utilities, and other public infrastructure cost FEMA an estimated 49 billion between 1998 and 2014. Uh, flood damages are a major burden on taxpayers, on all of us. Um, since Hurricane Katrina, the National Flood Insurance Program, which is run by FEMA, um, has been deeply in debt due to all of these hurricanes that I've mentioned. Um, and many other disasters. And when it comes to these hurricanes, a lot of um, the reason why they are so expensive is the property damage. And many of these properties are being repetitively flooded over and over again because they keep getting, getting rebuilt, like I said, and, and, uh, and then repeat in that flood rebuild repeat cycle. So 30,000 of these um, flooded properties have flooded five times on average. And as you can see on the graph, graph to the right, there's been an increase in repetitively flooded properties. And there are slight spikes in those numbers where um, those Katrina, Sandy, and Harvey occurred. Some long-term consequences, um, you know, include contamination and disease, floodwaters can carry raw sewage, leak toxic chemicals and raw from hazardous waste sites and factory farms. The picture on the right is of a hog farm that was flooded in 2018 from Hurricane Florence. Um, and so raw from that huge livestock operation can spread large amounts of fecal matter throughout the landscape, which is not great. <laughs> and so floods can also pollute drinking water supplies and cause eye, ear, skin, and gastrointestinal intestinal infections. And when flood waters recede, they can leave mold, um, which increases rates of respiratory illnesses and uh, such as asthma. Um, floods can also uproot whole communities, and they are um, especially impactful to vulnerable populations, such as people of color, uh, elderly folks, low-income folks, um, who are disproportionately impacted. All right, so how do we mitigate floods? Um, there's lots of ways to mitigate. I'm gonna go over a few of the main ones um, that are most effective. One is elevate your homes, as I mentioned. Two is to relocate the home. And three is to um, buy out or demolish the home. And so these are the best ways we can you know, simply just by getting out of the way of flooding. Um, and the two most impactful flood mitigation strategies are relocating and buyout and demolishing the home. So buyout um, is when a government agency, usually your local government agency, um, purchases a private property, demolishes the structure, and preserves the land as open space. Um, relocating is similar to a buyout, um, but a little different. It also involves um, a local government agency paying for a home to be moved to a new safe area away from flooding, and then the government agency must preserve the land as open space. Um, this is a win-win. These are both win-win-win situations um, because the homeowners get to move away from the flood risk, and the open space that's left behind is restored to a floodplain, which helps mitigate flooding. Uh, but there are challenges involved. Um, these two mitigation strategies cost a lot, they're expensive, and they take a lot of time um, due to how federal assistant funds are allocated. Uh, buyouts can take on average to, of 5.2 years. And by that point, properties are usually flooded again and homeowners might be reluctant to sell their homes. Okay, um, so buying out relocating properties are such effective mitigation strategies because they result in restoring floodplains. Uh, both riverine and coastal floodings have so many natural and beneficial functions, including natural flood storage, erosion, erosion control, and wa water quality maintenance, which includes filter nutri filtering nutrients and impurities from stormwater runoff, um, processing organic waste, and moderating water temperatures. Uh, they can also reduce waves and water velocity, which brings down that tidal flooding, and they can recharge our groundwater and um, 
and provide fish and wildlife habitats, which Dave will talk about. Um, so restoring our floodplains is so important and can help us address a lot of the consequences of flooding. So what can you do? Um, I'm gonna mention a lot of things that you probably have already heard of today, um, but prepare flood, for a flood specifically, it's important, um, some of the things you can do is to plant a rain garden um, that will help increase water storage, prevent flooding. You can make an evacuation plan so you know what to do when a flood occurs and you can help save lives and, uh, and protect your property. Um, elevate your valuables such as your washer and dryer. You can research flood risks, so maybe ask your parents if you guys have flood insurance or um, figure out what your susceptibility to uh, floods are in your area. And I have plenty of resources for that if you are interested. Uh, you can clean out your gutters so that water can drain properly or install a sump pump. Uh, for flood prevention, it really comes down to curbing climate change um, as an important way to prevent a lot of the worst case scenarios. Um, this it takes ambitious actions um, like advocating for climate justice, uh, voting, you know, for flood mitigation policies or for um, uh, elected officials that support uh, flood mitigation policies, um, recycling and reducing and reusing, eating less meat and dairy, reducing your carbon footprint by going uh, car or plane free, <laughs> uh, buying less clothes and reusing clothes um, and buying local food products. And so I have plenty of resources, like I said, if you're interested, please let me know and I'd be so happy to give them to you. Um, so thank you and with that, I will take, uh, well, actually let's take questions at the end since we are running a little short on time and I'll pass the baton over to Dave. Okay, I'm gonna have to unfair my screen real quick. Many screens. <laughs> All right. All right. Can people see the slide? Hope so. <laughs> yep, slide is showing up. Thank you. Great. Hey, uh, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm coming to you live from. Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm here to talk about the Great Plains and Great Lakes and um, kind of the impact of how uh, these flooding regimes that uh, Eleanor was talking about have an impact on avian ecology. So um, first off, I'd like to talk about myself. Oh, hold on, there we go. All right. So uh, just a little bit about, about my avian biology background. Um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but um, just wanna say that it's a, it's been kind of a short ride for me. I arrived to, to birding a little bit late in my life, but I began in 2015 just as a hobby. And um, then in 2016 and 2017, I took on um, some jobs working with the Michigan DNR. Um, I started uh, my second undergrad at uh, Michigan State University studying fisheries and wildlife biology. And then um, I worked for Michigan State Bird Observatory and uh, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies doing uh, work with migratory birds and breeding birds. Um, and then in 2018, I graduated from Michigan State University. Yay, go green. Um, and then in 2019, um, I worked in uh, Kiwa on Kiwa Island in South Carolina, again, banding migratory birds. You can see there, um, I, I'm in, uh, in the thick of it there, uh, just mesmerized by this beautiful uh, hooded warbler. So just, to, I know I'm gonna talk about two specific bir birds today, two specific species, but I wanted to uh, touch base on birds in general. Um, obviously what you're seeing in front of you is not a great graph. Uh, we see a major slide in uh, North American birds since 1970. This, uh, this was published just last year um, by the Audubon Society. So we've lost 2.9 billion birds um, since 1970, and that is uh, in addition to natural death. Um, so uh, where I do a lot of my work is in the grasslands of the, uh, uh, of the Great Plains, 
And those birds collectively have declined by 720, 720 million birds. Um, so as global temperatures rise and weather patterns shift, these kind of vital habitats like grasslands and, and wetlands start to disappear. Um, and we see these extreme weather events that Eleanor was mentioning, especially uh, in the tropics, uh, where they'll, these, these events will wipe out entire bird colonies. And right now, actually, after Hurricane Dorian um, last year came through the Bahamas, it essentially, at this point, we're assuming, completely um, decimated the Bohemian uh, nuthatch population to the point that we think that they're extinct now. Um, so again, touching further on this, uh, the Audubon Society has found that nearly 66% of all species across breeding, which is summer, and non-breeding, which is winter seasons, were classified as vulnerable um, under our uh, current pace of global warming, which is three degrees Celsius. Um, so as an indicator species, birds are telling us the time is act to act is now. So let's touch on the Great Lakes. I'm going to shift over now to get a little bit more specific. All right, so um, we've seen a general rise in water levels since uh, the historic low in 2013. Um, and according to Scientific American, uh, this change is uh, because of precipitation increases in winter and spring, um, which are consistent with the fact that a warming atmosphere can transport more water vapor and converting this water vapor to liquid and ice releases energy. So as a result, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to all you uh, science nerds out here, so uh, bear with me. As a result, increased atmospheric moisture contributes to more precipitation during extreme events. So that is in its simplest terms to say that when weather patterns are wet, they are very wet. So when, it's, when uh, it rains, it pours, like Eleanor said. All right, so now we're going to zoom in into Lake St. Clair, which is smack dab. If you see uh, in between, it's a small lake in between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. Um, so Lake St. Clair is sometimes referred to the Sixth Great Lake. Uh, I know that Mr. Muick, he, uh, he always calls it the Sixth Great Lake. Um, and uh, it's about 130 miles of shoreline. And it's relatively sh shallow with uh, about 10 feet of depth. Uh, so there's this major shipping route, though, that connects the, the St. Lawrence Seaway essentially all the way up to through all the Great Lakes. And you can kind of see the line going right through there. Um, and it, shoot, it shoots right up the St. Clair River there. Um, and about 97% of the water entering Lake St. Clair comes from that river. Now we're going to move into a little bit closer. So if you look up where the point is, that's St. Clair Flat State Wildlife Area. So the reason I'm zooming in here is because it's a, an area right on the delta of St. Clair River where that major shipping lane is and where all that water comes from. So it's this massive 6,500 acre site um, that provides critical habitat for uh, both rare and threatened species, kind of like um, sandhill cranes, glossy ibis, bald eagles, king rails, cattle egret, short-eared owls, and of course, black terns, which are all birds. Um, so I'm gonna focus in on those black terns, all right? So black terns, you may have seen them if you're in the Detroit area. Um, they are similar in stature to gulls. They kind of look like them. They're kind of annoying like gulls too. Um, and they, they have this beautiful uh, color of charcoal gray and jet black. They've got super pointed wings, as you can see on that juvenile on the left. Um, and that provides them great ability to, uh, to glide through the air and make swooping movements uh, for foraging and evading predators like you and I. Um, <laughs> they uh, nest in large freshwater marshes in small social colonies. Um, and they're one of like maybe three total terns in the world in the entire world that nest in marsh in freshwater marshes. Um, and in the last half century, this species has lost about half its North American population and 70% worldwide. Um, so they tend to nest in places that are vulnerable to flooding and water level fluctuations. 
and they uh, you can see here they nest right on top of the water so uh, it seems uh, ill-advised but that's just what their niche in the ecosystem um, and they breed in these habitats that provide enough vegetation to protect their nests from predators and storms but also with enough access to open water that they can take flight if they need to, um, to escape predators or just to uh, forage for some food, which are typically fish and insects. Um, so St. Clair Flats house one of the largest black term colonies in the Great Lakes. Um, Great Lakes colonies have, however, plummeted since the 1960s, due in large part to habitat loss and degradation and if you're here at this symposium, you probably have an understanding of why um, it's both to humans and climate change. So um, we see that the water levels in Lake St. Clair have risen well above average since 2018 and spring and summer precipitation in the area has also increased substantially since 2013. Um, so what do we see as a prediction for, for the black terns? Well, Climate change is likely to bring more intense storms and water level fluctuations. And right now, research suggests that high water levels, frequent storms, and limited vegetation mats decrease the nesting success of black terns, which is the suggestion for why possibly these, uh, these Great Lakes uh, colonies have plummeted. So what is being done right now to save them? Well, in the last slide, you could see my friend there, Caleb Putnam, he uh, spearheaded this kind of research in the, for the Black Terns in Lake St. Clair. And there's continuing research now. Um, and the Michigan Sea Grant has now gotten involved and they're working with the University of Michigan and the Audubon Society to uh, study how these water levels affect Black Tern colonies in the St. Clair Flats. So. Um, Prior to this massive amount of, of water inflow, uh, we saw really shallow water in the Great Lakes. And we saw that we have evidence that, that shows that the low water levels has harmed the population. Now we're trying to research if these uh, high water levels will, do, will have a similar effect. Um, and now we're also kind of like the, if you know anything about loons, which maybe you do, maybe you don't, we have gotten involved with saving them with making uh, a nesting platforms for them. And so kind of like that, Audubon Society is now experimenting with uh, floating human-made nesting platforms uh, to kind of um, stem the tide and help this population out. Um, also, we, can, we found that uh, the, the climate change mitigation efforts can stabilize, uh, if they can stabilize mean global temperatures uh, at 1.5 degrees versus the, the current three, um, this could lead and would lead to the greatest reduction in the number of species vulnerable in the breeding season. How can you help? Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna ask you to maybe screenshot this slide and the next, um, but in general, you know, practice con uh, energy conservation and, and support renewable energy, get involved at the local level, you know, tell your uh, elected officials that you, you want what, uh, what you want and what you think could be good for, uh, for the climate and, and the world in general. So again, screenshot this one, take a picture of it, whatever, and, and then this one as well. Um, so again, uh, the biggest thing to take away is uh, birds are an indicator species. We, we all can do our part by, by listening uh, to them because they already know what's, what's up. Okay, so moving from Great Lakes to uh, the Great Plains. So I grew up in the Great Lakes and I do most of my work in the Great Plains specifically the Northern Great Plains. So that's kind of uh, north of Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, Wyoming, Colorado. All right, so just a quick brief history on the Northern Great Plains. So uh, pre-colonialization, uh, so before Western settlers came in, you saw tall and short grass prairies that were naturally managed by bison and, uh, and, and a fire regime. You saw prairie potholes, which are essentially just uh, uh, small ponds um, and, and mighty rivers like the Missouri uh, that just span the entire landscape. 
It is home to some pretty extreme weather, including blizzards, massive temperature swings, and drought. Um, but before settlers came, you would see bison by the millions. We're talking like 30 million bison. Um, there were grizzly bears and black bears, prairie chickens, ocelots, wolves, pronghorns, you name it. Um, and it was home to about 90% of the ducks and waterfowl in our country. Now, post-colonialization, all that grassland essentially has been uh, converted to agricultural land, so farming land. Uh, the tall grass prairies have been reduced to 1% of their former self. Damming, ditching, and tiling have led to increased uh, intensity of the floods. Um, agricultural irrigation has reduced the volume of the Ogallala Aquifer by about 9%, and that's what you're seeing on the, on the screen right there to your right. Um, the, the darker the red and or orange is where we're pulling more and more water out of. Um, and we've seen a steep decline, obviously, in grassland birds. Um, and on top of that, gray wolves, ocelots, grizzly bears, and to a certain extent, black bears are gone from that area. Now, they're not extinct, but they're extirpated. Um, bison, prairie chickens, and, and piping plovers have nearly been eradicated as well. So what was that that I just said? Piping plovers, that's right, we're moving on. Piping plovers, that's our second species we're gonna look at. So you'll find piping plovers in Michigan, you'll find them along the Atlantic coast, but one of the biggest populations we have is actually in the Great Plains, along the Missouri River, along the Niobrara River, along that whole area where uh, we got those big mighty rivers. So what is a piping plover? Well, it's a, it's a shorebird, so it looks like a little cotton ball with legs. Um, and there's about 8,400 individuals in the wild today, total, uh, not just in the Great Plains, but everywhere. They, ne they nest in soft sand away from the water's edge and along river sandbars in the Northern Great Plains. And they're endangered yet again to habitat loss, dis disturbance and predation, mostly from humans and climate change. So we see them arrive on their breeding grounds uh, in that yellow area of the country and in Canada around mid-April and peaking in numbers during late April and early May, which is now becoming the rainy season. Um, so piping plovers return to the same sites. So that's kind of important here because they want to come back to exactly where they were the last year. And their home ranges aren't very big. They're about 45 feet total. Um, and so so it's very limited space that they have to work with. You can see how they, um, how they build their, their, their nest. They're not like a robin's nest in a tree. They're just kind of like a divot in the sand lined with some shells and, and their chicks and their eggs blend right in. So they do, they, they, they make these, these habitat, their habitat is right along these rivers um, and or along kind of those prairie potholes and all those habitats are under threat from human related causes. All right, so some of the breeding habitat threats that we, we see um, are dams, channelizations, river infrastructure, hydro peaking and changes in the annual water flow. Um, and as a result, we're seeing a reduction or elimination of riverine habitats, including sandbars historically used for nesting. Uh, so where these birds would have come back to may not exist the following year. Um, and also in these areas where you have uh, the expected river lows and highs, you have great invertebrate uh, abundance, which is their main food source. Uh, but with these increase in flow, water flows, uh, you don't have the access to the invertebrates. So, uh, you know, the, the quality of habitat goes down. Um, and even more so, these higher flows are correlated with longer time to fledge, fledging because um, Adults have to fly off the nest more uh, in search of more food, so they're not incubating as much, and uh, there's more chance of uh, predation. So I want to uh, touch on flooding. Is it only human-made? No, of course not. You're here talking about climate change. Um, what you see there on your screen right now is the bomb cyclone of 2019 covering nearly the entire United States. Um, it led to some massive uh, 
failures in our infrastructure. You can see the Spencer Dam on the right failing in 2019 and the Missouri River near Omaha just overflowing its banks. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm kind of limited on time, so I'm gonna kind of go right through this. So again, we had massive climate change uh, influenced um, weather patterns in addition to all that human made um, disturbance of our waterways, which just compounded on each other and led to massive failures, uh, destruction of both man-made and natural habitats. Um, and it lasted in 2019, at least from January all the way through December um, in historic amounts of rain. Um, so what is, our, what is our prediction for these piping plovers based on climate change? Well, they're predicted to lose more than 29% of their winter range, which is down in, in, on, the, on the coast down in Florida, and about 38% of the original summer range. The Northern Great Plains are projected to experience a wetter climate by the end of the century, and spring precipitation is expected to increase up to 40% given our current uh, climate emissions scenario. So um, not getting too deep into this, but what this graph is showing you here is that uh, we need wet, dry, wet, dry periods so that vegetation uh, gets destroyed and walked and moved out so the sandbars open up. But if you have consistent water levels, which is what we're doing right now and, and higher water levels because of, of climate change, that uh, the bare ground disappears and uh, vegetation stays. So habitat is lost then. What, what's happening right now? Well, there's plenty of conservation, short-term conservation efforts being done, like um, exclosures around nests to reduce predation or trampling. Um, we're also dredging some rivers so that we can uh, create sandbars. Um, and, and these are all short-term things, but we're starting uh, to manage the form and function of riverine ecology, kind of to make it so that it's a long-term fix. What can you do to uh, help? Well, you can report the location of piping plovers specifically. So once a nest is found, and, and this can be anywhere, Great Plains, Michigan, out, out east, um, it will become protected. Uh, don't make rock piles uh, or take driftwood home for, uh, for art. Um, leave it there because it's protection, it's shelter, it's a food source for these birds. Um, and obviously keep your dogs on a leash and stay on trail because uh, you're destroying a lot if you don't. Um, and in general, keep your cats indoors. They kill more birds than any other non-native threat. I'm serious here, keep your cats indoors. If I see your cat outside, I'll probably not talk to you ever. Um, then reduce your lawn space. Um, and create uh, an area for plant uh, for native species, um, and then drink coffee. If you drink coffee, uh, do it with a bird friendly attitude. So get some shade grown stuff. Um, it's it's pretty tasty. It's economically uh, beneficial to farmers and can help up to forty two species of North American songbirds. Also, take a screenshot of this. Save it for later. Okay, thank you. That's me with the uh, Eastern Screech Owl. All right, now we'll take some questions. Okay, so first question. Do you think that once people start started focusing on mitigation of climate change and its effects, there will be improvements in flooding and bird health slash migration? Can you say that question again? It's a little quiet on our end. Yeah. Do you think that once people started focusing on mitigation, climate change, and its effects, that there will be improvements in flooding and bird health slash migration? I mean, yeah, I think that um, that that will be a step in the right direction. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and I encourage, I encourage the, the question asker and others who are like them to uh, get involved, you know, um, and, and get involved even at the local level. Uh, and, and you're about to enter the, the point in your life where, where you've got to make some decisions. Um, and I think some of the decisions you make here, whether it be going into uh, uh, environmental law 
but going into politics or even into uh, Eleanor in my field, that's that's going to be the major um, step uh, in the right direction, I think, um, just getting involved, you personally getting involved that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, focusing on mitigation strategies at all different levels, the community level, the state government level, the federal government level. Um, this field is going to be so important in the future. And if you're interested in, in helping, um, you know, you know, get involved, like Dave said, and feel free to ask us questions about career paths if you really want to uh, become a climate scientist or, or do what, what we do um, as scientists. We um, do pretty cool things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we do, um, but yeah, so yes, definitely. Um, it requires involvement at all levels um, from all people from different walks of life. So um, everyone has to be involved. Um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and one more real quick. Mm -hmm. So the person said that their teacher said that warmer temperature makes volume of water rise, but they said that one of your slides says that the opposite by saying that water volume decreases due to evaporation. They just want clarification on that. Okay, um, I think I know what slide they're referring to. Um, if, if you're referring to the Great Lakes water levels, um, yes, warmer temperatures do increase um, more moisture in the atmosphere and therefore causes heavier precipitation events. Um, and it also can cause higher evaporation rates. So from 19, I think it was 1998 to 2013, there were some record lows in the Great Lakes water levels because the evaporation rates um, were higher than the amount of water coming in, right? So um, more water was leaving the system than was entering. And then in, in 2013, um, we started to see an increase in, in precipitation events and there was, um, also more ice cover on the lakes, which um, helps decrease some of those evaporation rates. So there was more water entering the system and less water exiting. And so that's why we see a higher rise in uh, Great Lakes water levels today. Thank you guys okay. so much for presenting. No problem, thanks for having us. Go change the world. <laughs> Session four starts at 2.05. You now have a eight minute break. All right, thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated.